a couple of months ago, I installed some hardware that makes the water output from my water well system much more consistent in pressure. Uh, I did a video tour about that product. I thought I'd do another video showing how this is installed and how you can select different sort of options for making it all work. So this is the intake line here and an overview of the system. This is the pressure switch, turns the pump on and off. This is the pressure gauge that shows you the water pressure in the tank. That red thing is the top of the cycle stop valve, very important, and I'll talk more about that later. And then that's the line going to the rest of the house. This is the water tank, and you'll notice it's very small. And the ability to have a small tank is one of the advantages of the cycle stop system. Before I get into installation details, I just want to give you a quick overview of what the cycle stop valve does. So I'm going to draw a pressure gauge a large version of the pressure gauge that would be on most water well systems. Numbers like this refer to the pounds per square inch, or PSI rating. And imagine my marker is the needle on this dial. Most pressure systems are set to click on at about 40 PSI, and the pump clicks off at about 60 PSI. As water is used, the pressure drops, hits that 40 pounds per square inch level, the pump comes on, delivers more water, switches off at 60. So it's back and forth like this. Water pressure is going to be going up and down noticeably at your tap and that's something you can often see uh, when you're taking a shower for instance. Another problem with this is that your pump is constantly going on and off and pumps don't like that. They wear out quicker because of it. So the cycle stop valve solves both these problems. Here's how. Imagine the tap turns on and the pressure drops to 40 psi. The pump returns the pressure to 50 psi, but it holds constantly there with the pump running all the time as long as the tap is running. When the tap is shut off, the pump still is running, so the pressure rises to 60. Tap turned on again, pressure drops to 40, pump kicks in, pressure rises to 50, and is held constantly there. As long as the tap is running, the pump will keep on running at that pressure. And steady water flow is the benefit. So, can a cycle stop valve be installed in any home water well system? Well, the vast majority can use this sort of a valve, uh, but not every water pump can take it. And that's what I want to show you about here, when you can and cannot install a cycle stop valve. The vast majority of home water pumps are of one of two types, either a submersible pump or a jet pump. There is another kind of pump called a piston pump, it's not very common these days, and that's the only kind that you can't install a cycle stop valve in. So why is that? Well, that's because of the throttling action of the valve itself. Submersible pumps and jet pumps can be throttled by the valve, and this is why. Both of these types of pumps have some version of an internal water wheel. It's the spinning of this wheel that actually moves water. The cycle stop valve creates back pressure against that water flow, varying the volume. And that's how it maintains constant pressure. A piston pump is what you call a positive displacement pump. This means there's actually a piston and a cylinder with a connecting rod here. And that piston goes back and forth and it forces water into the cylinder and it can't be compressed, so it can't be throttled as submersible pumps and jet pumps can. The good news is that at least 95% of all water well system pumps are of the kind that can work with this valve. Here's a close look at the cycle stop. This is the CSV1A. It's a very common type used for residential water systems. And I want to show you what the ports mean. This is the inlet, so that's water coming from the pump into the valve. This is the outlet that goes to supply water in your house or to a separate tank that's remote from the valve. Sometimes you can install a tank underneath if you want a, a small tank and it threads right into the bottom. If you have a separate tank you can plug that. These smaller ports are for different things. This front one is for the pressure gauge and switch and then the relief valve on the back. If something were to happen and an overpressure situation developed, the excess water would go out safely through this special port. On top is where you can adjust the level at which the cycle stop valve operates. 
So that steady state pressure I was telling you about earlier. Now I'm going to show you how the valve fits into the system in relation to all the other parts. So what you see here first is the well coming out of the ground. There's some kind of pipe coming out of the well too. It's almost always underground, but for this schematic I'll just show it up here where you can see it easily. Every system of this sort has a pressure tank too, and I'm showing a larger separate pressure tank in this example. Connected close to the pressure tank, there'll always be some kind of a gauge that lets you see what the water pressure is in the tank at any given time. And nearby there will also be a pressure switch. I'm going to show you more on the switch later and how it can be adjusted. If you're working with a system that has a separate tank, maybe you're keeping the tank you have or, or you want to have a, a larger tank than can fit under the valve itself, as in my case, you'll want the cycle stop valve to be located somewhere between the pump and all that other stuff. So the gauge, the pressure switch, and the tank. Uh, the cycle stop valve needs to come first before anything else. Now if you want to save space, of course, the valve is constructed so you can put a tiny tank on the bottom, but with a larger tank system, this is how it works. Regardless of the details of your system and how you splice in pipes and make connections, you will have to create waterproof threaded fittings, uh, threaded fitting connections like this. Brass, copper, PVC, any kind of pipe that can thread into the cycle stop can be connected to it. Threads on their own will not hold water, so you need to do something to waterproof those threads. One excellent option is Teflon tape. It's effective and completely safe. It's a thin, non-sticky tape that you wrap around the threads of the fitting. You'll probably want four or five wraps in any given place on those threads in order to create a thick enough coating for the Teflon to do its sealing work. And, and here I'm, I'm wrapping now, but notice how the threads are pointing down as I wrap. And that's a pretty important detail because of the way the end of the tape points. Now when I'm tightening this threaded fitting in, I'm rotating it clockwise. And you can see here the end of the tape is pointed in such a way that when I turn that in, it flattens down and does not get caught on the female threads I'm threading into. Now if I had made the mistake of wrapping the Teflon tape in the other direction with the threads pointing up instead of down, it's a very easy and actually natural way to, to want to wrap this way. Everything would look fine until I go to tighten that thread. And then a problem is going to occur because the end of the Teflon tape is pointed in the wrong direction. And it's quite likely that it'll get caught as I tighten it in and bunch up and cause leaks and just general trouble. So remember to wrap the Teflon in the correct direction so that it lies flat when you do thread the connections together. This is the kind of pressure switch that you're going to see in a lot of home water systems, and I, I want to talk about how they're wired and how to adjust them. I've got it removed here from the system so you can see the details more clearly. These top nuts control pressure settings, as I'll explain in a minute. The outer wire terminals are for the two energized wires coming into the system. The two central connections are to the pump. So when the pressure changes, these contacts open and close and either energize or de-energize the wires leading to the pump. The inside of the cover of all these pressure switches has all the information you need in case you forget any of this stuff. What you're going to want to look for especially though is what these nuts mean here because they allow you to control water pressure. The larger of the two, the one in the middle of the switch, is designed to control both the cut on and cut off water pressures. So that's that 40 and 60 PSI level I was telling you about before. You tighten it and you raise those two together, you loosen it and you decrease them together. The other nut controls the cut off pressure only. So if you loosen that, that 60 PSI level is going to decline without affecting the 40 PSI level. All this said, in practice, it's best to leave the little nut alone and just focus on the larger one to control cut-in and cut-out pressures. Now's the time for me to explain 
how and when you might want to adjust that steady state pressure setting on the cycle stop valve. Uh, that's that bolt that comes out of the top of the, the red part of the housing. So once again, we'll start with a, a shot of our well here and a water supply coming out of that well. The first thing we come to is the cycle stop valve. And this is the adjustment bolt on the top that governs that steady state pressure setting. Leading from the cycle stop, you might go to a small pressure tank. If it was small enough, it would screw right to the bottom, but I'm showing it separately here so you can see it more clearly. The smallest tanks might be about four and a half gallons or so, not a whole lot bigger than a basketball. At the other end of the spectrum, you might have a large tank. Maybe you've got a, a big tank in your system and you don't really care about making it smaller, but you still want to have steady pressure. A large tank like this could be as big as 80 gallons or more. Now, why does this matter? Well, it has to do with how long the pump runs after a tap is shut off, after the system's been functioning at that steady state pressure level. And what you want to shoot for is a maximum of about two minutes of runtime after the tap has shut off. This upper limit yields the most economical use of electricity. So, for instance, if you have your cycle stop valve set to 50 PSI as its steady state operating pressure, it's probably only going to take 20 or 30 seconds to bring that small tank up an additional 10 PSI before it hits the 60 PSI level and shuts off, which is fine. Now, if you have a larger tank, it could take quite a bit longer. If you started from that 50 PSI steady state level, it might take 10 or 15 minutes to fill up a large tank, depending on the output of your pump. So in that case, you might want to crank up the steady state pressure to say 58 PSI so that the pump only has to run for that recommended two minutes of time after the tap shuts off.